Hey everyone, and welcome. You know, communication is everything, right? We use it all day, every day. But it's just as vital for all the electronics in our lives, from your computer to your car. And a lot of the time, they're talking to each other using a simple, super elegant method that's been a workhorse for decades. So let's kick things off with a question that really gets to the core of this. How do all these complex gadgets we own manage to have conversations with each other using, in a lot of cases, just two tiny wires? Well, the answer is all in how you send the information. All right, let's dive right in. To really get our heads around this, we first need to look at the two fundamental ways data gets from point A to point B. It really all boils down to a single choice. Do you send all the data at once, or do you send it one little piece at a time? And this right here perfectly shows the big trade-off. Think of parallel communication like a huge eight-lane superhighway. All the cars, or in this case, bits of data, travel side by side and arrive at the same time. It's super fast, but man, it requires a lot of lanes, a lot of wires. It gets complex and expensive fast. On the flip side, you've got serial communication. That's more like a single lane country road. It's simpler, it's cheaper, and as we're about to see, for a ton of jobs, it's actually the much smarter choice. And really, it all boils down to this. Simplicity is a huge win. When you send bits one after another, you need fewer pins on your kips, you need less complicated wiring, you also get to dodge these really tricky timing issues, where bits on different wires might show up at slightly different times, a problem called skew. For so many electronics, it's a no-brainer. Simplicity and reliability are just way more important than raw speed. All right, so with that in mind, let's see how this whole idea of serial leads us to one of the most common types of communication out there. And this, my friends, is where we finally meet the star of our show, UART. UART. It stands for Universal Asynchronous Receiver Slash Transmitter, and it's a physical piece of hardware, an actual circuit built for sending and receiving serial data. But the real magic word here, the one you've got to remember, is asynchronous. See, a lot of systems use a shared clock signal that acts like a metronome for both devices, keeping them perfectly in time. Asynchronous means there is no shared metronome, which, if you think about it, brings up a pretty big problem. Yeah, that's the central puzzle, isn't it? If there's no conductor leading the orchestra, how on earth does everyone know when to play their note? How does the receiving device know exactly when to listen for each bit if there's no shared beat to follow? Well, the answer is actually pretty simple and kind of genius. They agree on the rules before the conversation even starts. First, they agree on the speed, which is called the baud rate. You can just think of that as the bits per second tempo for their talk. And second, they agree on the exact structure of the data they're going to send. It's like two people agreeing to speak English at exactly 120 words per minute. Now this is where things get really cool. We can actually see how these rules are baked into every single chunk of data that gets sent. So let's do it. Let's build a UART packet from the ground up, piece by piece. So before a single bit of data is sent, the communication line is just sitting there in a high voltage state. We call this a logical one. This is the idle state. Think of it like an open phone line. There's a dial tone. It's silent, but it's ready to go. It tells us the connection is alive and well. Now, to start the conversation, the transmitter does something super specific. It yanks the line down to a low voltage, a logical zero, for exactly one bit's worth of time. This is the start bit. It's basically a universal signal that shouts to the receiver, hey, listen up, a message is starting right now. The instant that start bit is over, the main event begins, the data frame. This is usually seven or eight bits of your actual message. They get sent out one after the other, typically with what's called the least significant bit or LSB going first. 
So here, for example, you can see the bits for the letter S marching down the wire. Okay, next up is an optional but pretty clever little feature, the parity bit. This is a super basic form of error checking. The transmitter just adds one extra bit to make the total number of ones in the data either even or odd, depending on the setting. The receiver does the same math, and if the numbers don't match up, it knows something probably got scrambled along the way. And to wrap it all up, the transmitter sends out a stop bit. It does this by driving the line back high to a logical one for one or sometimes two bit lengths. This is the over and out. It tells the receiver the message is officially done and puts the line back into that quiet idle state, ready for the next packet. Okay, so we've just put a single data packet under the microscope. Now let's zoom out a bit and look at the entire journey a piece of data takes when it travels from one chip to another using UART. The whole thing is this really elegant dance of conversion. It all starts with the CPU, which thinks in parallel. The transmitting UART is like a packaging station. It takes that parallel data, wraps it up with the start, parity, and stop bits, and then sends that whole package out the door serially, one bit at a time. Then on the other side, the receiving UART catches that stream, unwraps it, throws away the packaging bits, and hands the clean, original parallel data over to its own CPU. It's beautiful. Okay, now this next part is maybe the most important thing to remember. For any of this to work, there is one non-negotiable golden rule. Both devices have to be on the exact same page. The baud rate, the number of data bits, the parity, the stop bits, they all have to match perfectly. A mismatch, especially in the baud rate, is the number one cause of problems. If one side is talking at 9,600 bits per second and the other is listening at 115,200, you're not going to get a conversation. You're just going to get a bunch of digital gibberish. So at this point, you might be thinking, okay, this sounds kind of old. With things like super fast USB and Ethernet around, are we really still using UART? And the answer is a huge resounding yes. It's not just relevant, it's everywhere. It all comes down to a classic engineering trade-off. What you lose in raw speed, you gain in incredible simplicity and low cost. There's no complex software stack, no complicated hardware handshakes. It's just a simple, reliable point-to-point -point workhorse. It's not trying to be the fastest horse in the race. It's trying to be the most dependable one. And because it's so simple and cheap, you find UARTs all over the place in the world of embedded systems and DIY electronics. It's the absolute go-to for connecting little modules like GPS, Bluetooth, or RFID to a main microcontroller like an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi. Plus, it's a lifesaver for debugging. Engineers use it to get a simple command line into a device to see what's going on inside, which is just invaluable when you're trying to figure out why something isn't working. This quote right here just nails it. UART isn't trying to compete with protocols designed to stream movies. It has found its perfect niche, providing a rock-solid, dead-simple, and cheap-to-implement communication link for the countless jobs where you just don't need blinding speed. It knows its job, and it does it perfectly. So in the end, UART is this fantastic piece of technology that proves, once again, that sometimes the simplest solution is the one that lasts the longest. It's a reminder that elegant simplicity often wins. Which leaves us with one final thought to chew on. In a world that's only getting more complex and more connected, where else can this simple, reliable workhorse still make a difference? Thanks for watching. Thank <laughs> you.